Thanks, thanks very much. I think it, I'm going to say a bit about Marx before focusing on Marx, the revolutionary, more specifically. In other words, Marx as a revolutionary political activist. Um, and I'm going to explain why I want to look at Marx from that kind of angle. But I want to say some things about the Marx bicentenary, the bicentenary of his... Um, of, he, of his birth and the, the broader significance of his work because it's been quite interesting. Um, I wrote a, a book on Marx called The Revolutionary Ideas of Karl Marx. I think you can buy it for some very reasonable price still uh, at Bookmarks. It was published in 1983, which was the centenary of Marx's death 35 years ago. And um, at the time, it came at a time when there'd been an immense political radicalization reflecting the movement against the Vietnam War, the Black Power Movement, the great workers' struggles, for example, in this country against the Heath government in the early 19, 1970s. Uh, and that had led to an immense appetite for Marxist ideas, not to be studied as an intellectual exercise, but as a guide, guide to practice, a guide to the practice of revolutionary politics. But by 1983, that wave was receding. We were not far from the great miners' strike of 1984-85 that represented the worst defeat that I think the British working class government has ever experienced. Um, and there were comparable defeats in other countries as well. And that the defeat of the miners was part of the triumph of Margaret Thatcher and the installation, first in Britain and then in other countries, of what we come to call neoliberalism. In other words, the kind of free market version of capitalism that is dominant, dominant globally. And part of that, um, part of the installation of neoliberalism involved the trashing of, of Marx. The trashing of Marx from the point of view of the establishment for who portrayed Marx as a totalitarian, someone whose ideas were fundamentally at odds with any notion of freedom and so on, so on and so forth. But it also, Marx was also trashed from what was supposed to be the advanced, uh, critical, um, innovative sections of the academy who were all much more into, for example, the work of Michel Foucault and used his work to show how Marx was irrelevant. So it was a difficult time to defend Marx's ideas then. I think the situation is radically different today. It was very, very interesting to see how respectful the coverage of the Marx bicentenary was in the establishment press, the Washington Post, the Financial Times, the uh, Economist and so on. These are journals that aren't exactly advocates of the overthrow of capitalism, but they took Marx very seriously. Um, uh, in, in, in particular, um, there was a, a very good article arguing that Marx is fundamentally relevant uh, by the economic historian Adam Tooze in the Financial Times, you know, which is slightly like, um, you know, the, the Vatican newspaper, Os Osservatore Romano, look how excellent my Italian accent is, carrying an article in favor of saying that the church should take a second look at atheism. Um, <laughs> now, there's a reason why you have that very different coverage of Marx. And the basic reason is the crash. In other words, the financial crash of 2007-8. Actually, Tooze is just publishing a book about that crash. In other words, <coughs> <coughs> the crash suddenly confronted capitalism with its mortality. It showed that neoliberalism didn't represent, after all, an unproblematic solution of its problems, but in fact, in certain important ways, had destabilized it. And of course, since then, we've seen that capitalism hasn't just been destabilized economically, in a way that continues, as anyone who heard the great talk by uh, Michael Roberts earlier today will have, have heard, but it's also been destabilized politically, unfortunately, mainly in the form of the rise of the racist 
right in countries like the US and Italy and so on and so forth. But nevertheless, this is a sign of the weakening of neoliberal capitalism. And this means that the, um, even the most ruling class organs have decided they have to take Marx seriously. One sign of this, one indication of this, was the publication in, um, I think it was 2014, of a book by the French economist Thomas Piketty called Capital, um, which actually, um, Piketty is an economist, so he doesn't understand Marx uh, at all. Um, <laughs> You know, so it's slightly cheeky of him to have called his book Capital. But nevertheless, if you read the book, it's very interesting because it describes not just the remorseless growth of economic inequality in the past few decades, but also argues that this rep rep is a consequence of a fundamental law of capitalism as an economic system. So uh, Piketty kind of tries to distance himself from Marx, but he's conducting a kind of criticism of capitalism which, which Marx... Marx pioneered. So, what this underlines is that it's very hard to talk about capitalism, certainly in a way that acknowledges that it has, com it has, com that it has problems without talking about Marx. Because Marx was the greatest critic that capitalism ever, has ever had. There's a certain sense in which you can say that Marx invented capitalism. Of course, there were bourgeois political economists like Adam Smith and David Ricardo who laid the way for Marx, but they didn't have a concept of capitalism. Marx, on the contrary, his great work Capital is an analysis of what he calls the capitalist mode of production. Capitalism is an economic system. But he calls what he's doing, he doesn't call his work, a study, what I've just said, a study of capitalism. He calls it the critique of political economy. And that's a very interesting way of, of putting it. Um, because political economy was the name that was given to mainstream e economists in the 19th century. Um, so Marx is carrying out a critique of the dominant ways of thinking about capitalism. But actually that critique is a double role. It's a critique of the theories and concepts of mainstream economics. Indeed, in a letter to the German socialist leader LaSalle, Marx says the book is going to be a critique of economic categories. But it's not just a critique of economic categories. It's a critique of the economic system that these categories partly reveal and partly seek to apologize for. So in critically engaging with the classical economists and the, their much uh, less interesting successors, what he calls the vulgar economists, who are essentially the ancestors of contemporary neoclassical e economics, in engaging with them, he's also trying to explain the fundamental logic of capitalism as an economic, economic system. And one other thing that it's worth saying about the critique of political economy, uh, Marx came out of the tradition of German philosophy, of German classical idealism, Kant and Hegel in particular. And in that tradition, Kant means, sorry, critique means something very specific. It doesn't just mean saying you've got it wrong. It doesn't just mean saying you've made a mistake or indeed that you're stupid. Although Marx does say that people are stupid quite a lot. Um, it's more pointing to the limits of a particular way of thinking. In other words, it's not just that you've made a mistake, but the mistakes you make are a consequence of the limits of the kind of thinking that you're, that you're using. And in the case of the, the, econ the uh, political economists, the limitation springs from their commitment to capitalism as a system. They tend to think of capitalism as natural. In other words, not as just a historically contingent social system, but as the product of um, human nature, somehow co corresponding to human nature. And that means they can't carry out a sufficiently profound critique of the nature of capitalism. Okay. Now, Marx, Marx's, if you like, positive account of capitalism says it is a system that's defined by two fundamental conflicts. The first 
and more important of these conflicts is that between capital and wage labor. In other words, capitalism is a system that is founded on the exploitation of wage labor. Wage labor may sound fancy. It simply means uh, people who, um, or the situation that workers find themselves in, where they lack the economic security and independ independence to support themselves and their families. So the only way they can live and support their families is to sell their labor power to a capitalist. And because workers, as Marx shows very well, very vividly in capital, or as long as workers confront capitalists just as individuals, they're at a huge bargaining disadvantage because the capitalists have all this money. That's what capital is. It's loads of money uh, that capitalists invest in making even more money. Um, workers make a deal that leads to their exploitation. So the source of the new money that capitalists get when they invest it in employing workers comes from the exploitation of workers. The profits of capital are what Marx call, derived from, rather, what Marx calls surplus value. The, the new value that workers create when they produce commodities and in creating that, 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 um, and that the key portion of that value is then seized by the ca capitalist. It doesn't simply go to, to allow the worker to provide for themselves and their family. So this is the fundamental contradiction of capitalism, the defining contradiction, the exploitation of wage labor. The second fundamental conflict is that among capitals themselves. In other words, you know, there's a, there's a kind of fake radicalism which says that everything is a conspiracy, that the capitalists, the bosses, the rich, and so on, you know, are manipulating things from behind the scenes, and they're in control of ev everything. Don't believe what you read in the papers, because it's all manipulated by this tiny group of people. This is not at all Marx's vision of capitalism. The capitalist class are themselves an internally divided class. They are, as he famously puts it, in part of Capital, his great work, a band of hostile brothers. In other words, the capitalist class are fragmented. They compete with each other, each trying to get as much profit as they can for themselves compared to all, all the other capitalists. They're thieves who quarrel over the loot that they've extracted from workers. And this means that no capitalist, however big, however rich, um, dominates the economy. They're all caught up in a situation that they can't control. And it's the interaction of these two elements, these two conflicts, the exploitation of wage labor, oh, I'm going on too long, and the, um, the, the competition among what Marx calls many capitals, this fragmented capitalist class that drives capitalism as a system. The competition makes capitalism dynamic because capitalists, as you read in the textbooks, if they actually use the word capitalist, because capitalists uh, invest in more advanced technology to cut their costs relative to their rivals, and this leads to higher productivity and to economic growth. So capitalism is a d dynamic system, but it's also a system that's inherently prone to, to crisis precisely because of this process of technical innovation. Because technical innovation, I just said, means higher productivity. That means fewer workers producing a given amount of goods and, goods and services. But it's the workers' labor that creates the profits that fuel the system. It's the workers' labor, that, the living labor, as Marx puts it, that is the source of the surplus value. And this leads to what Marx calls the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. In other words, capitalist investments over time are likely to secure less and less pr profits compared to those inve investments. And it's this that leads to the crises that regularly shape the history and development of capitalism. So the development of capitalism isn't a smooth upward process of growth like the textbooks tell you. It's a jagged, uneven, conflictual process, process because of its foundation in exploitation, 
and the polarization of society that that involves, the division between rich and poor, and because of the way in which crises are built into the development of the, the system. But that, that's not how Marx envisaged his great work, Capital Finishing. It's, it's notorious, well, to nerds like me, any, at any rate, it's notorious that Marx never finished Capital. He only published Volume 1, in 1867, he never finished the final two, uh, second and third volumes, but left it to his poor friend Frederick Engels to do it. But he did write to Engels a letter in which he said how it was going to finish. And he said it's going to finish in the class struggle and the smash up, up of all this shit. Sorry, Marx's words, or word, not mine. I, uh, he was using unparliamentary language. And by this whole shit, he meant capitalism. In other words, although the, the core of Marx's study of capitalism is an attempt to analyse the economic logic of, of capitalism, what drives it at a, at a system, the conclusion was political. The conclusion was, in the context of crises, there'll be greater polarisation between capital and labour, and sooner or later the working class will seize the opportunity and get rid of the whole system. Now, this brings me to the aspect of Marx that is neglected, which is Marx the revolutionary, Marx the political activist. We have this picture of Marx as someone who spent all his time in the British Museum reading and taking notes. And it's true, he read an unbelievable amount. Even at the very end of his life, when he was sick and uh, bereaved with the death of his wife and two of his daughters and so on, he still was reading and studying enormously. He was, um, so he really worked tremendously hard to uh, try and understand the world in which he lived. But this wasn't as an end in itself. He wasn't just someone who was interested in collecting facts. He wasn't interested in criticism for his own sake. These days there's a lot of talk of critical theory, and sometimes critical theory the theory is spelt with a capital T to show how important it is, you know. You're not just engrading, engaging in theory, theory with a capital T. People write books about how theory developed and so on. This wasn't what interested Marx. One of his early books is subtitled A Critique of Critical Criticism. In other words, you know, there are all these bloody intellectuals who just go on about criticising society. That's not what he was interested in. He was interested in the overthrow of capitalism. He was interested in revolution. Most famously, uh, one of his early texts, the thesis on Feuerbach, finishes the 11th thesis, the philosophers have always interpreted the world. The point, however, is to change it. So his orientation is towards revolution, to getting rid of capitalism. But he also has a very specific conception of revolution. He didn't think of revolution I've said he didn't see the capitalists as just an all-knowing conspiracy, but he didn't think of revolution as some sort of conspirator conspiratorial act by, you know, a small, a tightly -knit, knit group of, of people. On the contrary, for Marx, revolution was an upheaval driven by struggle from below. Early on, he said that socialism, the alternative to capitalism, involves what he called the self-emancipation of the working class. What does that mean? It means people, the workers, the exploited, liberating themselves. No one doing it for them. No state, no party, no group of intellectuals transforming society for the workers, the workers freeing themselves. He celebrated the Paris Commune of 1871 when the working people of Paris briefly took over the, the capital of France and created their own government to run it precisely as an example of working class self-emancipation. So when people say Marx is a totalitarian, they don't understand the fundamentally democratic thrust of his thought. But this isn't just thought. Marx didn't just say, smash capitalism. It's easy, you know, I can say smash capitalism as much as you like. Capitalism just kind of shrugs and carries on. Marx was a political activist. And I'm just going to talk briefly. How much longer do I have? 
Okay, all right. 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> since I'm speaking for 35 minutes. Um, um, okay, I'll probably take, uh, take less than that. But um, I'm going to talk about one particular episode in Marx's career, which was the period of the what's called the First International, the First International Socialist Movement, <coughs> which existed between 1864 and uh, 1872. It was called the International Working Men's Association, slightly unfortunate name, although it was open to women as well. This is something that Marx supported. Um, it was founded crucially by trade unionists in Britain, um, in order to create much stronger solidarity among different groups of workers. But the trade union leaders, then as now, weren't exactly, you know, what shall I say, brilliant intellectuals. And they realized that there was this brilliant intellectual, this German exile, Dr. Karl Marx, um, who was already very well connected on the radical left uh, of the day in, in Europe, so essentially the person who ran the first international was, was Karl Marx. So he played a central role in the development of this first international, international working class movement. And um, it's very interesting because if we think about those years, 1864 to 1872, what was Marx also doing at that same time? He was writing volume one of Capital which was published in 1867. So at the same time as he's producing what is clearly his theoretical masterpiece, he's at the centre of building the first international working class movement. So that shows how theory and practice were combined in his thought. And you can see it in the book. There's a brilliant chapter on the working day, chapter 10 on the working day, which is all about you know, the bosses trying to get workers to work as long as possible and how this kills people and wrecks their lives and so on and how the workers are organised to stop this and begin to force state legislation to limit the working day. So it's all about the class struggle. I mean, there are some stupid people who say the class struggle isn't in capital, but the class struggle runs through particularly the chapter on the working day. So he's learning from what workers are doing and integrating that into his, his analysis. I think the other thing to say is that this re reflects his internationalism. For Marx, capitalism is a world system. Um, there's, uh, in some ways, uh, even better than the chapter on the working day is the chapter, I can't remember the number, I think it's 31, on the genesis of the industrial capitalist. Sounds very boring, but it's actually about how industrial capitalism develops by conquering the world, by um, seizing uh, the Americas, by enslaving Africans, African people and sending them into the plantations of the Caribbean and, and, and so on. So he shows how capitalism is a brutal and barbarous system, but from its inception a world system. So it can only be fought on an internationalist basis by the world working class. That's why the Communist Manifesto, much earlier work, ends with the, um, the appeal for workers of all countries to uni unite, because it's essential to achieve socialist revolution. Now, okay, so Marx de develops the first international. Unfortunately, in the end, it fell apart. Guess why? Because there were internal divisions on the left within the first international. Not the first time that had happened, and unfortunately very mu much not the last. But nevertheless, what Marx did was very, very interesting. I want to give two examples. 1864 it's founded. This is in the final phase of the American Civil War. The great struggle to destroy, what, what became the great struggle to destroy slavery in the United States. For Marx, this is absolutely essential because he sees the, the Civil War is a struggle between two systems, emerging industrial capitalism in the North and the slave power, as he calls it, in the, in the South. And he says, if the North doesn't destroy the slave power, then it will spread to the North as well. Uh, it will lead to greater racism, more forms of 
what we now, uh, of forced labor and what we now call precarious labor. So the future of working people in the United States, and more generally, depends on destroying the slave power. Uh, the North initially didn't do very well, and in his letters to Engels, Marx says, things will change when Lincoln, the American president, is forced to arm the blacks, to arm the ex-slaves as a, as a revolutionary blade driven into the heart of the South. And that's indeed what happens. Um, one of the first things that Marx did as the secretary of the First International was to write to Abraham Lincoln to congratulate him on, on his re-election in, whenever it was, November 1864. So this racial struggle or struggle central to which is race, is crucial, from Mark, Marx argues, from the point of view of the international working class movement. But he develops this idea much more fully close to home, in the case of Ireland. Ireland in the 19th century is formally part of the so-called United Kingdom. It's a British colony, ruled by force from Lond London through Dublin Castle and the apparatus of coercion there. The endless struggles by Republican, Irish Republicans to break free of Britain. Initially, Marx thinks this is utopian. British capitalism is too strong. But in the 1860s, while he's in the, um, building the first international, he changes his mind. And he says, not simply can the Irish win, but it's crucial that they should, should win. And it's crucial that they should win, he says, not primarily from a moral point of view. In other words, he supports the Irish right to self-determination, but he also sees the importance of the Irish struggle from a strategic point of view. And there's this fantastic letter that he wrote to two friends in the United States. And we should remember that Irish manual laborers, Irish migrant workers, essentially built the Britain of the Industrial Revolution. They built the roads, they built the railways, they built the sewers. They were the, it was on their backs that, um, that British capitalism, industrial capitalism emerged in the form that we, we know, it to, know it today. But this is what Marx says. All industrial and commercial centres in England now have a working class divided into two hostile camps, English proletarians and Irish proletarians. The ordinary English worker hates the Irish worker as a competitor who forces down the standard of life. In relation to the Irish worker, he feels himself to be a member of the ruling nation and therefore makes himself a tool of his aristocrats and capitalists against Ireland, therefore strengthening their domination over himself. He cherishes religious, social and national prejudices against him. The Irishman pays him back with interest in his own money. He sees the English worker in the English worker, both the accomplice and the stupid tool of English rule in Ireland. This antagonism is kept artificially alive and intensified by the press, the pulpit, the comic papers, in short, by all the means at the disposal of the ruling classes. This antagonism is the secret of the impotence of the English working class, despite its organisation. It is the secret of the maintenance of power by the capitalist class, and the latter is fully aware of this. Now, this is the most brilliant analysis because what Marx is describing is the most important form of racial division in British society in the 19th century because Irish people, Marx talks about the popular press. He's absolutely right. Irish people were portrayed in racist terms in 19th century Britain. There's this horrible comic paper called The Punch which have these obscene caricatures of Irish people. You found the same in the US as, as well. So Marx is saying in Britain, because of the imperial connection between Britain and Ireland, the working class is racially divided. And this is the hidden secret of the impotence of the British working, working class. This is why the British working class remains subordinated to its exploiters. And there, and he argues, I don't, Sarah will shoot me if I read any more, um, that that he argues in the rest of the letter and in other works of the time that this makes it strategically crucial that the British working class, the unions, 
uh, and with the support of the First International, should support the Irish struggle for national independence, because this will begin to hold, break the hold of b great British nationalism and racism on the majority workers in, in Britain. Now, I think that's the most brilliant analysis. And it's one of the parts of Marx's writing that gives the lie to the idea that Marx is this dead white man, this, you know, 19th century Victorian uh, figure uh, who has no relevance to the world of today. I mean, it's nonsense because of what he writes in Capital and how he uncovers the logic of crisis that is still work today. But more, more, in this political, these political writings, he is describing where we are today. Not, fortunately, as extreme, at least in this country, as what he describes in 19th century Britain, but we see a working class throughout Europe, and of course in North America, that is divided racially, uh, and where the ruling class is very actively working to increase these ra racial divisions. Look at Trump and Salvini, the right-wing uh, interior minister in Italy, and the way in which they're using anti-migrant politics to break the hold of the more conventionally neoliberal sections of the Western ruling class like, like Mer Merkel. Racial politics and the division of the working class between so-called settled native workers and migrant workers is central to the kind of politics that we struggle today. And here is Marx talking about it back in the, at the beginning of the, the 1870s. And what he's really saying we can generalize from it, is that oppression, in other words, the way people are dominated, not on the basis of class, say on the basis of race, or uh, gender, or sexuality, or national origin, these kinds of oppression are class issues. They are issues that are of central importance to any working class seeking to emancipate themselves. Because although these different forms of oppression have different causes, they're different, if you like, material underpinnings of these different kinds of oppression, which we can discuss, all have the effect of fragmenting and dividing the working class and therefore allowing the capitalist to continue to dominate. And Marx is saying this is a key problem that any struggle for working class self-emancipation has to, has to focus on. He didn't solve the problem. As I said, the first international fell apart in the early 1870s and he died a decade or so, so later. Um, it's something that um, revolutionaries and socialists have to struggle with, have to grapple with, so long as we don't get rid of, rid of capitalism. But Marx provided a framework that we can build on and learn from to, today. So this is why I think that Marx is important um, not just um, intellectually because of his critique of capitalism, because capital is such a great book, he's important to us from a political point of view. If we want to achieve the self-emancipation of the working class, and he saw that as part achieving what he called human emancipation, sweeping away all the different forms of oppression and domination, then we have to start with Marx. Of course, we don't finish with him. We have to go forward on our own, but if we don't learn from him, we're likely to be lost. Um, one of the, um, uh, uh, the knock-on effects of the scale of the environmental crisis is that all sorts of philosophers, thinkers, and, uh, uh, and writers are trying to interpret and explain and understand uh, what's going on in the, um, uh, in, in the world. And much of the philosophy, philosophical uh, explanations actually are, are often very obscure, obscure complicated, uh, uh, difficult to understand, and actually very rarely even get anywhere close to trying to explain uh, the great ecological crisis that we face. And one of the real fascinating things about, uh, about Marx 
Marxism is that there's been a resurgence, a re-emergence of Marxists attempting to use Marx to both explain the environmental crisis, its origins, and to, uh, to offer some uh, al alternative. And Marxism as a theory, based as it is on a materialist understanding of the world, of nature, uh, of human uh, human interaction, human society's interaction with nature is uh, is incredibly well placed uh, to, uh, to to do that. Marxism allows us really to explain why it is a tiny minority of people, a tiny number of capitalists, control um, uh, the, the whole system, a fossil fuel system that both destroys the environment and systematically destroys humans at the same time. Yesterday, Africa saw its highest ever temperature in recorded history, 51. 1.3 degrees Celsius, but Africa has 16% of the world's population and 3.8% of the uh, of, and causes 3.8% of emissions. If your theory cannot understand how that arose, then actually it's bunk. If all your theory can do is to try and offer philosophical explanations that somehow humans are all to blame, then actually it's not it's not good enough. And what Marxism does is it actually allows us to understand that the top of society is a, a, a group of people over system oversee a system and that accumulates wealth based on the degradation of, uh, of the natural world and the labor of, of, of ordinary people. But Marx goes further. Marx doesn't just explain it. He offers us a way of changing it. He offers us the people, the working class, who have the agency uh, to, uh, to alter that system. And what's fascinating about Marx's ecological writing is how revolutionary it is. When he talks about a society that's sustainable, when he talks about a society that doesn't systematically destroy the environment, it isn't a reformed capitalism. It is a fundamentally different society. One where he writes it could be, it leaves um, nature and the world in a better place uh, uh, for the future generations. It's an incredibly revolutionary view and we need to return to that revolutionary world if we want a society uh, that is ultimately sustainable for ordinary people. Just trying to sort out a small problem with the microphones. Um, but after Phil, if we could have Liam from Plymouth SWP. Thanks. Um, I have a very condensed question, but I don't think it's an abstract question. Uh, Alex, do you agree that Hegel's concept of spirit is very similar to Lukacs's concept of subject-object? Thanks, comrade. Um, and after, um, after Liam, um, if we could have Maxime Bowler, please. I'm afraid, well, I don't know. Another slightly pedantic sort of uh, point, really, I suppose. Um, more about sort of like the introductory sort of a section, talking about uh, the Financial Times and the capitalist press uh, sort of praising Marx and bringing it out as a thing. But I don't know, I think it has to be, This isn't really a legitimate sort of embrace of Marx as a thinker. It's... It's like what they're trying to reduce him to, I think, is in a medieval court where you'd have the king and nobody would be allowed to criticise the king except for the court fool who would be considered to be this sort of halfwit who was allowed to say these kind of things. And that's sort of the position, I think, that they're trying to relegate Marx to within sort of a capitalist thought. Uh, and as well with this, uh, the, well, this is the capital in the 21st century. Now, I have to admit, it's not a book I've read. Uh, it's quite a big book, as I understand it. I don't... Yeah, um, and I know obviously this isn't the place to go, in for, to go into this, but I would like some comment on it. As I understand it, it's quite a sort. It's not a Marxist approach in any way to sort of capitalism. The critique of it, it's an approach based on inequality and essentially sort of Keynesian reformist one. So I don't know. It's just there's Marx and there's the use of Marx, and I just I don't know. Like I say, a bit of a pedantic point, but I think it's something that sort of needs to be said. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Liam. Um, after Maxime, we'll have Mary Smith. Uh, but first, a question um, from Valeria. Um, and her question is, can you explain competition in the phase when or if everything becomes one big multinational company? And I will say anyone can try and answer that question. You don't just have to leave it to Alex. Uh, so get on in there. Um, I wanted to say something about the self-emancipatory dynamic at the heart of Marx's writings, because I think that's something that um, uh, 
has been distorted, really, um, by Stalinism, by um, most academics will argue that uh, it creates a totalitarian system. And I think we have to retrieve that emancipatory dynamic for Marx, really. And I think that Marx was the absolute democrat, really. Um, and he believed that the dialecting it in history was about the actions of ordinary human beings, not about kings and queens and individuals or ideas at the top of society, about the actuality of people doing and shaping their world uh, around them. So he says, men make history, but not in circumstances of their own choosing. This is about people acting on their world, and in the process of acting on their world, they change themselves. Uh, and not just they change their world, but they change themselves as well and I think that that's uh, that's incredibly important really and I think I'm not sure if it's Marx or Lenin who talks about chucking off the muck of ages but I believe that in the process of people fighting for a different world they change their ideas they start to understand that they're not just subjects that they have uh, abilities to change their world they have abilities to run their world they have ideas that are just as important as all these eco economists and I, I was at the meeting earlier on today where they talked about the uh, economists and nearly all of them were wrong on every bloody question anyway. So the idea that there's these experts at the top, no there aren't. And I think that's also important when it comes to today because really there is that idea that we should sit back and wait for Corbyn. I know not everybody thinks we should just sit back and wait for Corbyn. Some people in the Labour Party do think that we need to do things but there is a kind of push to hold us down, to wait for Corbyn, that Corbyn's going to come on his, right, his white charger and rest us from the mess that we're in and even Corbyn himself doesn't believe that's the case he thinks that people need to fight back uh, for themselves and I think that this is the important thing really about people's activity that they can change and shape their world and whenever people come forward to do something they start to feel that they have a power and that's the most important thing for me about Marx and the other thing is and it fits in with what Alex came to talk to about the question of the uh, uh, Irish proletariat they will try try and divide and rule us. If we don't fight back, it isn't just that we stay in the same position. If there isn't any struggle, then people can be, start to despair and they can be pulled towards the politics of despair. And in, uh, in past times when Marx was talking about, he talked about the Irish working class and the divisions there. But today we can talk about the rise of Islamophobia. It's the same kind, kind of dynamic that takes place. And that's why it's so important that we today fight tooth and nail for the next weekend to fight to fan the flames of resistance because that's what is what changes and shapes our world and changes us in the process. Thanks, Maxine. Um, after Mary, we'll have Talit Ahmed. Um, I just wanted to give an example uh, from Ireland of um, the way Marx uh, explained to us the way things change. Uh, dynamically, dialectically, all of a sudden. Uh, because um, in Ireland, you'll know, I hope, if you don't, I'm going to tell you, uh, we had a, a magnificent victory over uh, backwardness uh, that, in a way that we're all walking around with a smile, you know, this big. Um, Mark, you know, we're encouraged to think of history as a sort of a, 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 a gradual process uh, where we're all on this upward uh, riding escalator that's going slowly along and eventually you'll get to a level, if you're coming from somewhere like Ireland is or was, that eventually you'll come up to a place like where America or Britain or Germany or somewhere is. Actually, it works a hell of a lot different, um, and sometimes it's the very backwardness of a place or a society that when the brakes come, propel it forward in a way that is much more advanced than the people or the societies uh, to which it aspires to be like. And so in Ireland, you had uh, a place that could have been described as a priest-ridden hole. Uh, that we have had a, a history of a viciousness of Catholic domination. The word Ireland was almost synonymous with Catholic conservatism. Uh, women who had a child outside wedlock were officially described as offenders. 
Women who had more than one child outside, outside of wedlock were recidivists. What do you do with offenders? Well, in Ireland, what you did was you banged them up in the Magdalen laundries. Women were enslaved for decades. Uh, their labor exploited, the nuns made a fortune off them, making up for their sins. Or they were put in the mother and baby's homes where their babies were taken off them and the, uh, sold very often to rich people in America. Uh, and, and those women, the pain, you know, has been, has been boundless. Uh, even up until recently, I mean, the Magdalen Laundries didn't close until the 90s. It was 1979 before you could access contraception in Ireland without, and, and even then, you had to have a marriage certificate to get your condoms. Uh, we didn't legalise divorce until 95. We didn't decriminalise homosexuality until 96. But two years ago, we were the first country in the world to, uh, to uh, leg um, what do you call it? ratify uh, same-sex marriage by common suffrage. Uh, only a few weeks ago, you'll know that we voted by two to one to uh, bring in abortion legislation. Now, you imagine what se several states in America would give for a two-to-one vote to liberalize abortion. That's the sort of leap that's possible that Marx explained to us as possible. And an awful lot of that, as is often, you know, sometimes left out of an equation, has to do with the intervention of Marxists in it and actually making a common cause with people who are moving but have to move further and have to move quicker. You might be forgiven for thinking that the, uh, the process of uh, Ireland's um, repeal legislation was down to the fact that we have a new, cool, gay um, uh, Taoiseach who wears fancy socks and goes jogging. Uh, him and the, uh, uh, Harris, the Minister for Health, they were made out to be the poster boys of the reform movement, of the, of the repeal movement. It wasn't them. It was on the ground. It was ordinary people making those arguments with their neighbours, convening as a giant canvas teams right across the country and making those arguments and those arguments becoming possible because of the way things change that consciousness can, when given a break, leap forward and shake off the muck of ages. Um, and we have Carl to, thanks for it, to thank for it, and we have the intervention of Marxists to thank for it, and I hope you all celebrate it with us. Thanks. Thank, thanks, comrades. After Talit, we'll have Baba Ai. Yes, when Alex uh, read out that passage um, that Marx wrote about the uh, competition between the Irish and the English worker and what that means in terms of the, uh, the discrimination between them and how capital benefits from it, it's a part of the reason why it's so powerful is because, and again, when Alex said that you know, Marx is seen as just a dead white male, um, is how incredibly deep, even amongst certain radicals and certainly within academia, the perception is that Marx, if there is any relevance, um, then it really only applies to Europe and European developments and not anywhere else. Um, I mean, I teach Indian history, and, and again, a similar thing is put forward that, oh, you know, Marx, well, he did write about India, but really, really what he wrote was all about how um, India is just a backward uh, country uh, full of um, caste as an institution that had always existed since time immemorial and that therefore um, that's the reason why he talked about the British going into India as being some kind of progressive economic force. And if you, and they leave it at that. Now, if you look at the whole totality of Marx's writings on India uh, from 1853 right the way through to uh, 1858, um, it, at one level, yes, you can trace that he does use some very unfortunate formulations. But, you know, Marx had never been to India. He was relying upon knowledge that was produced um, 
from other people, uh, particularly from colonial officials who of course had their own particular racist framework in terms of how they were implementing the colonial regime in India. Um, and so therefore he was having to rely upon this kind of stuff. But what is also quite um, staggering is that when the 1857 rebellion takes place in India, you see in Marx's writings, and he's the first to grasp the significance of what that revolt meant inside of India. He begins to see and pinpoint the potential of what the, uh, the, the revolt was about, about how levels of consciousness amongst Indians in terms of seeing themselves as being oppressed and what the nature of the British Empire was going to be about. And it's for this reason that when he writes about it, he calls it the first war of independence in India. Um, and what's absolutely startling is that, you know, within history as an academic field, um, there, there are lots of people who teach Indian history. This is totally relegated in exactly the same way that the passage that Alex quoted about what he writes about uh, the Irish and the English worker is completely relegated. In Scotland, I live in Edinburgh, a book was published earlier this year uh, called No Problem Here, which is about teasing out the issue that racism is a problem in Scotland. And that's very welcome. Uh, many of the authors that have contributed to this book um, are people who largely see themselves as being on the left. Um, and there are three or four um, chapters in that book which are about um, anti-Catholic and anti-Irish racism within the Scottish context. And they make for very interesting and also quite worrying reading because the entire analysis that's presented in that is divorcing off uh, what is happening to Irish workers as if it's just like a Scottish phenomenon um, or just sort of um, to do with... Um, uh, what was happening in terms of um, the way that um, the, the, the land and the landed aristocracy inside of Scotland are behaving, etc. You go through the entirety of the chapters in there which are to do with this anti-Irish problem and anti-Irish racism, and there is not one single mention of Marx in any of them. Um, and, you know, and, and this is what is really tragic, because I think the most significant thing, you know, lots of people have already made the point in here, and it came through very clearly in Alex's talk, and that is that, you know, Marx, the reason he was able to analyze and look at the world that, that in the way that he did is because he was also an activist. Um, you know, he, he didn't just sit and theorize about theory for the sake of theory um, and critique for the sake of, of criticism, etc. He was trying to make sense of the world and he was starting from a point of a deep engagement inside of the world. And what happens particularly within academia and to this day, and it is infuriating, is how, you know, Marx's eyes are taught as a complete sort of abstract theoretical um, you know, esoteric manner, which is so rarefied that, you know, you have to have swallowed at least 10 dictionaries in order to make sense of him, or it's presented as if, yes, it was okay for the 19th century, it was okay for European developments, but it doesn't really help us to understand anything today. And Marx's writings, particularly uh, his writings on India, really demonstrate how Marx was an internationalist and how he was an anti-imperialist, and this is also something that we have to take heart from. Thanks, comrade. After Baba, we'll have Rob Hoveman. Uh, when I first became um, politically active on the socialist left, I joined a Marxist-Leninist organization. And we were made to believe that why it was Marxist-Leninist was that Marx was the theorist, Lenin was the organizer, you know, that made it happen. You know, but uh, studying Marx... Uh, deeper, one could see that while, uh, yes, Lenin made the revolution and uh, those that witnessed October after have no excuses, so to speak, uh, beyond objective conditions. It, it was probably, it wasn't right then, but it wasn't that Marx was just sitting in the British Museum writing. Uh, Marx uh, demonstrates what Sankara, Thomas Sankara said that, I mean, a revolutionary needs a certain amount of madness. And Marx did have quite... Uh, his fair share of dosages of that matter. And for me, um, from a generation in, in the Nigerian movement where um, confrontation with the state was not just uh, facing truncheons and uh, water cannons, but I mean, tanks and... Uh, go I couldn't but give Marx a red salute when you see his role in Cologne in 1848. He was from, I mean, as he was writing with the paper, 
they were facing barricades, life and direct, face to face, you know, life and death, putting their very lives at stake in, in, in this struggle. And, and, and for me also, when you look at uh, not only being a revolutionary, being a revolutionary is grasp of tactics and strategy, even, even the writing, the passion you see there is that madness from, from, from agitation for, to struggle practically. And, and you see, you, when you look at his arguments during 1848, he could, he could blend the practical, you know, with, with the broader theoretical perspective. You see his writings in uh, addresses to the General Assembly of the uh, International Working Men's Association. It was saying the same message, but it was taking note of the audience, you know, in, in pushing it. And the polemic form itself as a way of writing was a reflection of struggle, which was a practical thing. Now, I would say, in a sense, Engels summed it all up when he said that uh, Highgate, that uh, for Marx was first, above all else, a revolutionist. Thanks, comrades. Um, after Rob, we'll have Marnie Holbra. Uh, if you were to abstract Marx the theorist from Marx the revolutionary, and some academic Marxists seek to do this, you would still have to recognize that he was the greatest genius of the 19th century, seeking to understand and analyze the nature of the uh, capitalist system, not just of the 19th century, but of the 20th century, because after over a hundred years of neoclassical economics, which has dominated economics departments up and down, not just this country, but across the world, with hundreds and hundreds, thousands of people trying to theorize. They don't understand the way in which the capitalist system works, as well as Marx managed to theorize in the most incredible circumstances of poverty without the internet, without, mo without uh, fo you know, mobile phones and so forth. Incredible analysis, an analysis-based upon the idea that profits come from the exploitation of workers, that the capitalist class is, is involved in a ruthless competition one against another, which, seeks, which makes them have to try and increase exploitation, increase productivity, which in turn generates perennial crises uh, in the system in which all that's been produced, instead of being used for the good of everyone, is denied that, and the alienation of workers and all the rest of it. You know the you know the story. But of course it's absurd to abstract Marx the theorist from Marx the revolutionary. Marx raged against the machine he knew was oppressing us. It's why those, those categories of rage are built into his theory itself. Concepts of exploitation and depression. I want to say something quickly about, about our speaker tonight. It was my privilege 40 years ago to hear Alex Kalinikos as a student activist agitating for students to become active against this same system. And some five years later, I came to read the brilliant book he wrote on the revolutionary ideas of Karl Marx and no other book, well, it was that book actually, which persuaded me that Marx had something to say and more than that, Marx had something to make me do with my life. It's a brilliant book, if you haven't read it, please buy it and, re and read it. Just the last point about this, that book, and what Marx stood for was all about understanding the system, about having the patience to work against the system, but also the impatience to destroy the system to build a better world. Thanks, comrades. Um, after Marnie, we'll have Mike Killian. Yeah, it's interesting that many of the contributions have been about oppression, and I just want to make some brief points about women's oppression and Marxism. First of all, when Marx was writing, he was very fond of quoting the utopian socialists, uh. which said that uh, you judge a society, came coming from people like Fourier, you judge a society on how they treat women. And that's a very good guideline for us today. But Alex was talking about the revival of Marx, and one place in Northern, North America particularly, but also elsewhere, there's been a real revival of the idea of the family as Marx, going back to Marx, and looking at exactly the role that the family plays in capitalism. And this has, you know, it's sort of called social reproduction theory, but basically what it argues 
is that women's oppression, the unpaid work of women in the home, is systematically linked to exploitation and the price of labor power in the market. And this is interesting for people like me who remember in the 1970s that socialist feminism was less insistently Marxist than this. They tended to have an idea that it was a dual, not all, but in general tended towards a dual systems theory. What is so refreshing reading some of the social reproduction theory is that it really is insistently Marxist. It says that women's oppression is linked to the system itself and that there's no sort of dual patriarchy theory around. It is inherently in the system. And why that is so relevant today are really for two things. Is first of all, Alex said, you know, that kinds of oppression are class issues and no more so than amongst women. I mean, the huge gap between Hillary Clinton and a black woman, a person of color or a white woman in America shows that that kind of tokenistic feminism has nothing to say to the vast majority of working class women. But secondly, and we have to remember when Marx was writing, there were hundreds and thousands of women workers in the textile industry that he was talking about. So he was actually indirectly, if not, you know, he didn't explicitly, but actually the people that he was talking about in Lancashire and so on and so forth were actually very often women. And that's a phenomenon that we in Ireland have seen develop very recently, but for all of us means that the new working class is very much female, you know, is, is in some cases overtaken the number of men. And so therefore, this concept of class as being th thoroughly, you know, women involved in it, we've seen in recent struggles, the role, you know, a, a huge amount of women involved in struggles, whether it's teachers' struggles, white collar workers' struggles, and this idea that I think we can take further than some of the social reproduction theory to really turn it into a concept that can explain how real women's liberation could be won. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, mention the Paris Commune that came towards the end of uh, Marx's period in the International Wor Working Men's Association, 1871, um, a huge uprising uh, in Paris from which Marx learned uh, thing after object, item after item after item, if you like. Earlier, he had, of course, uh, written that workers cannot simply lay hold of the existing state machinery that grows up uh, under bourgeois society, but must totally smash it and replace it with something new. But he hadn't, of course, gone into detail or attempted to go into any uh, detail because of his belief that uh, uh, the uh, emancipation of the working class must be the act of the working class itself. Now, in the Paris Commune, he sees a movement right before him that begins to spell out how some of that uh, uh, could look. Universal suffrage, for instance, uh, one, well, one man, one vote, only, only for men at that stage, but still, at nowhere else in the world where there was any form of an uh, open voting system was it open to, to, to all males uh, without a property uh, 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 quali qualification. Instantly recallable delegates. Again, he was inspired by this very simple notion uh, uh, that the, uh, this, this new emerging worker state would elect people to carry out various functions, but they could be recalled and sacked at any time. Other simple thing, the average wage as a payment for uh, 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 officials. You know, you could, you could almost imagine smacking his head thinking, why didn't I think of that when I was talking about uh, the worker state? You know, a simple mechanism uh, that, that completely cuts across uh, uh, careerism, uh, bureaucratism, and uh, means that the, 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 uh, the organizers, if you like, of a worker state are instantly uh, 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 democratically recallable by the people uh, by the people who uh, put them there. And when you, you con consider that against what he was, you know, compelled to acknowledge, uh, uh, what, uh, uh, 20 odd years before, uh, in the failed uprisings of 1848, when, you know, the, 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 uh, the ancestors, if you like, the antecedents of today's capitalist class uh, were weak-kneed, cowardly, and failed to punch through against the old feudal uh, regimes that were uh, holding back 
capitalist development and how he had had to bitterly acknowledge that you know these people were uh, uh, the dustbin of history they would never lead etc cetera, etc cetera. now he saw a movement that could really uh, take things forward and it wasn't just you know it, that wasn't just the end of it it became it fed into what Lenin then developed in his ideas on the state and revolution and it remains an example of how Marx both uh, learned from the real movement and at the same time was able to inspire, you know, 20, 30, 40 years later, uh, 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 movements in, in, in and across Europe that could really inspire us to, uh, to, uh, to fight for a, a real change in the world today. After the next comrade, we'll have Ian Taylor. So, um, towards the end of his speech, uh, Alex stressed the importance of uh, anti-racism and internationalism uh, for the self-emancipation of the working class. So, um, I kind of want to make a different contribution because today there were two or multiple surprisingly large protests in Germany going on. Um, one in Berlin and elsewhere over the country. In Berlin, there were 12,000 people marching, demanding safe routes for refugees, demanding an end to the fortress Europe and the racist policies of the ruling class. That's something that... <laughs> that's something I couldn't have imagined happening a few weeks ago, to be honest, because right now, or until now, we've been on the defensive. We've been dealing with a growing fast ri far right, right? And also, on, to, on this day, we've had 18,000 people in my own home state marching against the new police laws, which would enable the police to imprison people for up to two, for one month um, for no reason. So basically, you don't have to be found guilty of any crime, but you could still be imprisoned. Uh, it would pretty much build up an, a surveillance state and allow the police to just scan your phones and your mobile data. And uh, there were 18,000 people marching against that as well. So um, maybe I can invite you. Well, we have some signs prepared. And if you want to, you can take part in this and take a sign after the meeting. And we'll take a picture to express our solidarity with the people fighting all over, well, mostly in Germany now, because, well, it's focused on that, but everywhere else uh, against repression, racism, and the ruling class is assault on, well, everyone's dignity and rights. So thank you. Yeah, definitely encourage everyone to join in uh, with the solidarity pictures. Um, so after Ian, our next speaker from the floor will be Sue Caldwell, who will be our last speaker before Alex sums up the discussion. Marx is one of the best known names in the world. Uh, one of the most criticized uh, thinkers in, uh, in history. One of, one of the most misrepresented uh, uh, in, the, in history. Uh, and yet not the most widely read. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. One is that Marx can seem, his writings can seem uh, difficult. But what's important it, about Marx is that he was striving for clarity, for precision in his analysis of, of, of capitalism. There's nothing sloppy in, in Marx uh, at all. And yet with, within that striving for precision, he could uh, attain a marvellous clarity, as, as um, Alex uh, demonstrated in the, in the passages he, he, he read, which is why his writings is, he, remain so valuable for us today and, he, and the, the method he developed of looking at the, at the, the world and at society remains so valuable uh, for, for us uh, today. As people have said, his ideas developed uh, not just theoretically, he just wasn't sitting in the uh, British Library for 30 years pondering uh, uh, and reading and, and so on. His ideas developed uh, out of and in relation to uh, the, the class, class struggle. And uh, so he was active in the revolutions of 1848, has, has been... Uh, talked about. He was forced to flee Germany and then, and then France, and that's why I ended up in, in, um, in, in London. One of the previous speakers talked about 
um, the, the Paris Commune and how Marx developed his ideas about working class democracy out of that and what it would, what it would mean in, in practice, the need to smash the state and, and so on. He produced one of the most brilliant pieces of reportage on that, um, the Civil War in France, which is a pamphlet, which is a fantastic piece of work, work, uh, piece of work to read. So what I want to say to people really is, don't be put off Marx, read Marx. Start with the Communist Manor Manifesto. And I defy anyone in, in the room to read the early pages of the Communist Manifesto and not think that this is the most wonderful description of the world today when it was published 140 years ago. Yeah, Sue's going to be our last speaker from the floor. Uh, apologies to people who put slips in and didn't get to speak. Uh, we, you know, I'm sure you can understand we've only got a limited amount of time, but I've tried to get as many of you in as possible. OK, thanks. So um, there's a common idea, isn't it, to say that there is a gap in Marxism, and a gap in Marxism is around oppression, that he's really good at writing about economics and so on, but actually when it comes to oppression... And actually many of the people who are writing in the Sorry? tradition of, the, of, of social reproduction theory start with this, that there is a gap in Marxism that needs, to, um, that needs to be filled. A number of people have talked about the questions of Ireland, of India, um, you know, even uh, Marx's writings on the family and so on, where he um, equates the bourgeois family, women in the bourgeois family, to being, to, to being effectively prostitutes and so on, in terms of the way that they are, are, are treated as possessions and so on and so forth. So, you know, I think there's lots of reasons within Marx's writing himself and within the practice of Marxists in the time since to show that that is um, actually not true. But of course, it doesn't mean that we go back to Marx as some kind of Bible that's written in stone. You know, what do we say about the arguments that are going on about transgender? politics, oh, I don't know, is it in capital somewhere? You know, it's, you know, what do we say about, um, organi about, about the people around Tommy Robinson? Are they fascist? Are they racist populist? What's going on here with UCAT? Oh, don't know. Did Marx write about it somewhere? You know, by the way, on that subject, um, congratulations to the anti-fascists in Leeds who outnumbered by about six or seven hundred to one Tommy Robinson supporters today. Um, but of course, what is important about that is that what Marx left us was a, a fantastic analysis of the capitalist system that we live in, but also a method through which to analyse and try to understand how to change things. And that is a method that, that, that starts with an understanding that the driver of capitalist society is capitalist exploitation at the point of production, that the motor of change in society is class struggle, and that has to be the self-emancipation of the working class, and that class struggle has to be rooted um, uh, 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 amongst the organisations working class. Yes, making connections with all the big struggles that Marx talked about, the struggle over the working day that Alex mentioned and so on and so forth, but connected with the organised power of the working class in the workplace. And the fact that there's a contradiction there, because also Marx said the ideas of the working, of, of, of the uh, in society are the ideas of the ruling class. So how are we going to fight to emancipate ourselves? The answer is in struggle. The struggle that is inherent in the system and the struggle through which people start to throw off the muck of ages. That gives us a method with which to analyse and find our way through these fudges about the questions of politics and why we always stand with the oppressed, why that's vitally important that we don't allow our class to be, um, to be divided and injury to one is an injury to all and so on and so forth and therefore, and therefore why we fight. And that really is what we do inside the Socialist Workers' Party. It's a matter of keeping those history and traditions and learning alive. And people who are in academia, people who study, you should challenge these backward economic reductionist uh, representations of Marxism. We should bring it to life of all the glory and emancipation of the entire working class that Marxism is really about. And that is the project that the Socialist Workers' Party is engaged in. Please join us today if you're not already a member. Uh, but now I'm going to hand you over to Alex, who's going to sum up the discussion. Uh, OK, thanks. First of all, two points about Marx personally. Uh, Baba was quite right to say that during the revolution of 1848-9, in uh, Germany, Marx was engaged in literally a life and death, death struggle because then he was uh, a, a subject, not a citizen, of the Prussian state, which was an absolute monarchy that was fighting for its life against a revolutionary movement of which Marx represented the extreme left wing in the most economically advanced part of Germany in the, in the Rhineland. And he could easily have ended up being executed for treason. His 
great friend and comrade, uh, Frederick Engels, took part in armed struggle against the forces of, of reaction. Other comrades of Marxists and Engels died in those struggles. So these are, were people who put their lives on the line in a, in a way that most of us haven't been tested, certainly. That's one point. Second point, it was great hearing what um, Mary Smith had to say about the abortion campaign in, in Ireland. And um, wh one of the things that is striking when you read Marx's writings on Ireland, particularly in the eight, late 1860s, which was a moment when the Irish struggle was at a particularly high level. It went through ebbs and flows throughout the 19th and early 20th century, century well, early 20, 20th centuries, if we think of the more recent, recent troubles, is the extent to which the Marx family, not just Marx, in other words, but his wife and his daughters, identified with the Irish struggle. He, there's a letter he writes to Engels. When there's a, an atmosphere of... Um, you know, um, there's a media panic about Irish republicanism of various uh, bombs that have gone off and so on and so forth, where he says, in my family, in, in my house, the Irish colours have flown all the time. So I'm sure the Marx family would have been extremely happy to, to learn of what, what happened a few weeks ago in Ireland. Just uh, some other points in response to, to the discussion. I mean, I don't think it's quite... Of course, well, the comrade who said, um, you know, the bourgeois media treat Marx as the court gesture. I don't think that's quite right. Of course, it's true they reject his, his politics, but they're forced to take him seriously because of the kind of economic problems that capitalism now, now confronts. Piketty, I mean, I said, he's not, he's not a Marxist. In some ways, though, his book is based on a... Uh, intellectual framework was a kind of caricature of Marx in that he posits a kind of iron law of inequality where inequality will grow so long as whatever it is, the rate of growth, rate of economic growth is less than the rate of interest, that inevitably the rich will get richer, which of course leaves out a small thing called the class struggle and how, how rich or poor people are relatively, is critically dependent upon the balance of class forces and so on and so forth. So, I mean, Piketty has interesting things to say, but, but he's, he's quite limited. Um, is uh, Lukács' concept of absolute subject-object um, based upon uh, Hegel's concept of absolute spirit? Yes, I mean, he says so. Um, so it's, it's not a difficult question to answer. But actually, this was an... I mean, History and Class Consciousness, the book where they, this equation is made, is an absolutely brilliant book, one of the classics of Marxist philosophy. But one of the things that Lukács later changed his mind about was the absolute subject-object. And um, he moved towards what I would... I mean, because essentially... What, what happens with the early Lukács is that he imposes upon Marx's analysis of the ebb and flow of class struggle that I've just been referring to, um, this highly abstract notion of absolute spirit, of some form of mind that is absolute, that isn't um, essentially part of the historical process. And Lukács changes his mind when he reads... Um, before they were published, Marx's Paris manuscripts in the, I think, the mid-1920s. And there he discovers one of Marx's crucial ideas, which is the idea that human beings are part of nature, but they interact with the rest of nature through their labor, and in the process change themselves and also change the rest of na nature. This is what Marx in Capital calls the metabolism of labor and nature the interdependence and interaction of labour and nature. Why do I underline this? Because Martin Empson talked about Marxist work on ecology, and one of the critical elements of that, in, for example, the work of John Bellamy Foster, who spoke earlier in this room t today, has been to take on this framework of the interaction of labour and nature, but to show how this interaction goes very badly wrong as capitalism develops further and further.
Uh, Valeria asks how competition can go on if capital unifies into one single tr multinational corporation. The simple answer to that is it won't. I mean, what we see, Marx himself in an early work says competition leads to monopoly and monopoly leads to competition. In other words, competition under capitalism, the broader process of accumulation of reinvestment, leads to the economy being dominated by larger and larger capitals. If you take that up to the limit, that would lead to a completely monopolized economy, but they're very powerful counter tendencies that lead to the dominant constellation of corporations at any time being broken up by further developments. For example, the development of outside competition. What are the, you know, the most profitable corporations in the world at the present time? They're corporations like Facebook, Netflix, Apple, and so on and so forth, most of which didn't exist 20 years ago. This is an example of how capitalism undergoes a constant process of change in which power, economic power can be concentrated very quickly if we think of the kind of dominance that firms like Facebook have, but it can be undermined by the further development of capitalism. Final point, I just wanted to say something about social reproduction theory, um, which uh, uh, Marnie from Ireland talked about. I mean, I think that one needs to differentiate. Um, the, the most powerful source of social reproduction theory is a book by an American Marxist called Lisa Fogel that was first published in the early 1980s called Marxism and the Oppression of Women. And it's a contribution to the intense debate that was taking place about the relationship between Marxism and feminism in those, those years. Where it's true that many, uh, even socialist feminists, argued that Marxism was limited, that uh, you needed to add to any kind of class analysis, analysis of patriarchy as an autonomous system. But the most advanced contributors to those debates refused to accept this idea and converged on an idea that you find in Lisa Fogel's book, but you find in the writing of a number of other Marxists. For example, within our tradition, the international socialist tradition, the work of Lindsay German and Chris Harmon, but also the writing of an, uh, an America, another American Marxist feminist, Johanna Brenner, all of which argue that you can use Marx's method to understand the role of women's oppression in capitalist society through the role that the labor of the woman plays in the privatized household, the family is a separate private unit, in reproducing uh, labor power for, for capital. So the oppression of women is integrated in to the, the process of development and reproduction of capitalism as a system. So Fogel is one of a number of thinkers who, as I say, converge on this idea as a result of the debates that were going on in the 70s that sort of came to an end, petered out in the 1980s, but not before these very important works were, were written. I think what we now have is a kind of generalization from Fogel's work, which is in the process of turning social reproduction theory into a, a theory of everything. So social reproduction theory doesn't just explain the oppression of women, it also explains racism. I don't think you can, I don't think the, this very rich analysis of the oppression of women but within uh, the privatized household is extendable to racism. I mean, we're talking about very different kind of processes involved in racism, both historically with plantation capitalism and slavery and so on, but also in terms of contemporary racism. And there are also arguments about things that Marx ignores he doesn't have a theory of need, for example, some of these people argue, which simply I don't think is defensible if one looks at Marx's work. I'm not saying this because I think that um, there's nothing, either that there's nothing of interest in social reproduction theory, there's quite a lot of interesting stuff, particularly Fogel's original work from the early 1980s, or that I think, you know, that Marx or any later Marxist has said, any, has said the last word on this subject. As Marnie said, Capitalism is changing as more and more women are involved in wage labor, for example. In all sorts of ways, capitalism is developing and changing. And one of the things is to struggle to catch up 
with the development of capitalism. That means more work by Marxists, but we should build on the work of our predecessors. Tony Cliff, the founder of the Socialist Workers' Party, talked about standing on the shoulders of giants, and the greatest of those is, is Marx. And we should continue to do that, not just theoretically, politically, but politically, and I just want to repeat what Sue said in appealing to people who, if they like the kind of politics and theory that they're hearing here, to join the Socialist Workers' Party. Because given the racist bastards that we're confronting at the very top of the system, but also in town after town in Britain, we need all the socialists we can to organise to drive them back and begin to destroy this rotten system.